you just a little bit about Nestle's uh, program and how it works. Now, I'm just wondering, what are you, um, do you guys see this moving? Nestle Supplier Diversity Program is operated by NBS, Nestle Business Services. And Nestle Business Services provides the procurement and support for all of our operating companies. There are six operating companies within the United States. That include NUSA, Nestle USA, Nestle Waters, Nestle North America Waters, Nestle Purina Pet Care, Nestle Nutrition, and Nestle Professional Services. I am clicking, but I don't see this moving forward. Here we go. All right, great. Nestle is committed to supplier diversity, and we have found that it's important to address the way in which supplier diversity can support diverse suppliers out there. So our agenda today, we are going to hear from me, Nestle, with an overview of our supplier diversity program and our second tier initiative. Then you will hear from McCann Erickson, a key supplier who will talk about how they stand looking both ways, trying to service the advertiser and then also working with the diverse suppliers. And then you will hear from a diverse supplier who will talk about their experiences. We will then have an open dialogue and Q&A. And we hope that you'll find the uh, information that we're discussing informative and will generate questions on your part. I've talked a little bit about Nestle, that we are the largest food company, that Nestle Business Services uh, provides the procurement uh, operational format for our company. And it means that if you want to do business with any of our operating companies, it's really NBS that manages that. And supplier diversity is an important tool for our diversity program. It's because as we see here with our mission statement, we believe that supplier diversity uh, advances the development of the best in class base of suppliers and that we need that so that what we do reflects the uh, multicultural aspect of the United States. We won't go into how to find out more about our program or how to register. We think the best thing is for you to take a look at this link below, which is says supplier teleconference that Nestle USA because by that you'll find out about our e-learning where we explain our various um, strategies in all of our areas and you'll be able to take a look at the e-learning that is most applicable to what you sell which is probably going to be in our advertising and um, marketing area. Okay. So now you'll be able to refer back to this. We have, with our supplier diversity program, three major components. One, we look for the best top performing suppliers to work with directly. We believe that this will improve the um, growth and profitability of our company. And then thirdly, which is what we're really going to be looking at today, we encourage our key first tier suppliers to include diverse suppliers when they're performing Nestle work on our behalf. The question that many people might want to know is why are, advertising, uh, why are advertisers such as Nestle requesting second tier spend? And it's because Nestle, along with other companies, find that we have policies or we might have regional requirements or global requirements where we really are required to work with key suppliers and that really limits the uh, way in which diverse suppliers are able to interface with us. 
So we find that by having a second tier program that's formal and operational, it provides a better flow through for diverse suppliers who wish to do work in Nestle's behalf to be able to connect with those key suppliers who actually have the contract. And we have a formal program because we have found that what gets measured gets done. And by having this tool in place, we're more closely able to align our, our uh, procurement objectives throughout the supply chain. When we talk about diverse suppliers and supplier diversity and second tiering, there are lots of different um, nomenclature that gets used again and again. We only, we're only going to divide it into three big buckets right now, direct purchases, indirect purchases, and the next slide will cover certification. Direct purchases are when we uh, ask one of our advertising agencies or a key supplier to do work in our behalf on a specific project. And they identify uh, women, minority, veteran, small businesses to do business on that work. When that happens, that's called a direct supplier because you're working directly on Nestle work. The other uh, definition or the other bucket is the indirect purchases, and that's when a company is hired by one of our key suppliers to help them with the overall business that allows them to do work on Nestle's behalf. So that might be uh, a company that provides the, um, it could be landscaping, it could be janitorial, it could be uh, logistics, it could be anything that helps them do business that's not specifically tied to a Nestle contract or Nestle work. And that's the difference between direct and indirect. Now when we talk about diverse suppliers, people say, well, you know, what, what is that? Who, what, who are we looking at? Well, different companies have different thresholds that they measure. Uh, the four biggest uh, commonalities that we're going to find in a supplier diversity conversation are going to be minority owned businesses and those are businesses that are owned uh, where 50 percent of the uh, ownership is ethnic minority that's going to be african-american uh, hispanic asian-american native american uh, we're going to count women to own businesses and that's when 51 percent of the business is owned by a woman and that doesn't mean that she owns 51% of the stock and does other things during the day. It means that she is intimately involved in the day-to-day -day operations and that she controls 51% and is instrumental in the decision making. The third is a small business. And small business, uh, we, most of us use the Small Business Administration's guidelines for what determines a small business. And that's basically going to be revenue. Then the uh, fourth one is veteran-owned businesses. And veteran-owned businesses is an area that's actually growing in importance to the economy. So uh, those are the four areas. And if anyone on the line fits one of those definitions, then you might want to look at um, the websites of the agencies that are shown here at the bottom of this website, the National Minority Supplier Development Council, the uh, Women's Business Enterprise National Council, or the Small Business Administration, which oversees both small business and veteran-owned businesses. And by looking at that area, you can find out who is, uh, who, who certifies whom and how, what type of information you need to supply and how the process works. And for certification is really important for us because we want to make sure that the companies that we are working with in the second tier program are actually who they say they are. And since we're all extremely busy doing what we do every day, Nestle's manufacturing uh, food, you guys are providing the services that you provide, the key supplier is providing the advertising or uh, marketing um, services that we require. None of us have the time to really go through and check to see that all of the diverse suppliers that are part of our database are who they say they are. Consequently, we ask and we recommend that you get a third-party certification. Now, some companies, such as Nestle, we also allow for self-certification. And in that case, 
a supplier is required to sign an affidavit and post it someplace in our in, in our case on our portal and it states that you know the what you're saying the information that you're providing is true and that uh, you realize that it's uh, against the law actually to falsify that that information now now that we've talked about the bigger umbrella of supplier diversity what the advertisers look for and why we have a supplier diversity program I'd now like to turn it over to uh, David Hamlin who is the Vice President of McCann Erickson who will talk about the uh, role of the key supplier in really making this whole second tier operation effective. Welcome David. Thank you Karen and welcome to all the attendees who are participating in today's webinar. Um, as a first tier supplier to Nestle, um, McCann Erickson uh, is in total support and committed to uh, helping our advertisers achieve not only their supplier diversity program goals, but our individual goals that we have within McCann Erickson and within the McCann World Group. So the topic of today's discussion is second tiering. Uh, so my remarks will be uh, sharing some comments pertaining to the advertiser, the first tier vendor, such as a large general market agency such as us. Uh, and also I will have some comments and some suggestions that I would make to the diverse supplier. On the slide that is currently in front of you, uh, what does this mean for second tier opportunities and best practices? Diverse suppliers will be considered, so when a referral, when I receive a referral as the supplier diversity manager for McCann uh, Erickson, in this case, Nestle, let's say, sends a referrals of diverse vendor to me, what can that diverse vendor expect from a first tier supplier such as McCann Erickson. In our case, it would be diverse suppliers will be considered and included in all outsourcing opportunities associated with a particular client's business. You heard Karen make reference to that earlier. They can also be assured we will work with them to uh, be added to an approved vendor list where applicable. Now, the way that works, and this is a very significant piece, some clients actually give an agency or marketing company an approved vendor list and that is the list that the agency must bought, uh, make their choices from for vendor selection. Other times, depending upon what was negotiated, who is the client, who is the advertiser, it is the discretion of the agency who outsourcing opportunities will go to. So it varies. So when you're talking to a supplier diversity person or anyone at an advertising agency, about a specific client, you do have to find out what are the parameters under which that agency is operating for a particular account. Do they have the final say-so in vendor selection or is there an approved vendor list? And we'll talk more about the approved vendor list in a little, little bit. Uh, when a diverse supplier is referred by a client, you can also be assured that your capabilities and your website will be reviewed to determine if there's a need for the service being offered. I can't stress the importance enough of having a very strong and robust website. Uh, within the advertising industry, that is the primary place that uh, not just supplier diversity people, but the functional decision makers within agencies, they are very much driven by websites. That's where they will go for information. That's where they will go to see samples of work. Um, that's where they will go to make a contact. Uh, I know personally, six months, a year after I have met someone, I eventually will go to a website when I have a need for something, and that's where I've got to find that information to help me determine, can this vendor really do what I'm looking for? And then also, who do I contact? A thing that you will frequently see, and I hear from a lot of my peers, uh, other diversity managers, are that the websites are, it can be very difficult to find contact information. So again, I can't stress enough the importance. Have a good, clean, easy to navigate website. Um, because again, 
a lot of times the opportunities won't come around for six months, one year, two years. Who knows when that opportunity might come? That website is going to be critical. So what does it not mean in terms of a referral? So you've gone to a, a Nestle. Nestle refers you to a McCann Erickson, says, go talk to one of our key suppliers. Here's McCann Erickson. One of the, what it does not mean when you get that referral, and this causes a lot of frustration sometimes when diverse suppliers come in to see me and then come in to see others at other agencies, that there will be no outsourcing of work that is currently done in-house. So as an example, if a person is selling creative, creative is what we do at McCann Erickson, creative is what we have paid employees to do, there will be, it is extremely rare and probably not going to happen that there would be outsourcing work in the area of creative. So again, it's managing expectations. So you have to understand, do some research and find out what is it that this company is looking for and probably uh, that will come just through relationship building. It also does not mean that uh, lesser quality and or service will be accepted which is a given. Uh, Nestle hires first-tier suppliers such as McCann Erickson to do world-class work. It stands to reason that all the subcontracting work that we do, those vendors have to provide that same world-class work. Next slide, please. Some suggestions for diverse suppliers. I strongly encourage you, if you get a referral from an advertiser, do research on the first tier supplier that you're going to, to speak with or meet with prior to going there. Uh, what you don't want to do, and unfortunately what does happen periodically, is walk into a, a meeting, an introductory meeting with a key first tier supplier, regardless of who it is, and walk in and say, hello, my name is David, and I'm here. Tell me what opportunities you have. That is not a good approach. That will not do at all because that tells the person that you really didn't care enough to do any type of research as to, well, what type of work does this agency do? What specifically are they doing for the advertiser so that you can focus your sales presentation uh, and maximize the time that you have to make an impact on whoever you're talking to? The next bullet point, again, I think is a very, very good suggestion have a plan B sales pitch ready that focuses on task. A little while ago I mentioned that if your company does creative work and creative is something that the tier one supplier is already providing to a company such as Nestle, then if you, once you come in and even if you do make a, a brief presentation about creative, you need to be ready to change gears in the middle of that conversation and focus on well, what task within uh, the work that is being done for Nestle uh, could your company provide. So that would get your foot in the door. So while you may not be able to uh, make an impact or have any opportunity for your primary business focus, if you already have two or three tasks that you know that your company can provide, then those are the things to switch that sales conversation to to determine if there are any opportunities to do one of those tasks for the key first tier supplier. What will frequently happen, and uh, Danette's going to talk about that when she gives, shares some of her experiences, uh, is that once you get your foot in the door, it's all about then relationship building, showing your quality, and uh, demonstrating that you can do even more work. For advertisers, a suggestion I would give uh, to advertisers in a second tier program, again, manage the expectations of the diverse suppliers, meaning refer appropriate diverse suppliers to their first tier suppliers. So if a person is sells, let's say, furniture, furniture might not be something that you want to refer to an advertising agency. Most advertising agencies buy very little furniture. Many of them don't own a building, so they don't have the typical brick-and-mortar type of things. It'd be better suited to refer them to some, another type of key supplier. This will uh, respect the time of the diverse business owner, and it also will cause them not to be frustrated if they come in 
and just get an instant no, we're not interested in buying furniture because that would lead them to say, well, why did Nestle even refer me to it? So whether it's Nestle or anyone else, advertisers should give some consideration and refer the first suppliers to the appropriate first tier suppliers. Uh, only refer diverse suppliers who are on your approved vendor list. Again, if you're an advertiser or you're a company uh, that requires the agency to work from your uh, approved vendor list, then you would not want to send vendors to the key suppliers when the key suppliers cannot use them. Again, it causes frustration on the diverse suppliers uh, part and it causes frustration on the key first tier suppliers part. So those are just some of the things uh, in managing this process of second tier programs that through a smooth coordination of effort, starting with the advertiser and the parameters with which the key first tier supplier must operate, the diverse supplier can then develop the best sales strategy that will have the greatest possibility of getting some business if we all work in a partnership, those three entities, uh, in the, any second tiering effort. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Danette, uh, who is going to talk a little bit from a diverse supplier perspective. Danette? Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. I um, founded a company called Soundtrack Marketing in 2001, and I just was going to give you a little bit of a profile of how we how we worked is this, the things that we've been talking about, the dynamics. And so there's a little graph there, and hopefully that's just a visual to help you follow along with this story. Um, initially, I started uh, with a music supervisor company, and we were providing music licensing and uh, music creative to film and television and advertising. Uh, and then I, we got a referral from a friend who was looking for someone to do sales in the airline. And uh, so Soundtrack Marketing actually was a sub subcontractor to a second tier supplier that needed stronger music industry relationships to sell the music advertising in flight. Um, it was initially a very small piece of business, and um, but we were able to triple their the airline's profits uh, with our you know with our new sales program. And within six months, the first tier supplier. Uh, contacted us directly and invited us to partner with them on an RFP that they were doing for Delta Airlines. Um, so handling, and that would be handling all their music of in-flight entertainment. So essentially we had impressed our client's client so that they wanted to work with us directly. Uh, we were awarded that business and at that point uh, we hadn't even spoken with a representative from Delta Airlines. We were only dealing with that first tier supplier who was Delta's designated creative consultant. Um, and after that, um, we were then invited by that first tier company um, who was our Delta partner to do a proposal for American Airlines. So while I was reviewing their proposal, uh, I noticed that it included a question about uh, our team's diversity status. And since I knew the first tier supplier was not a diverse company, um, they kind of missed the significance of that question and how it might affect us in the review process. So I inquired uh, with the, whether the fact that Soundtrack Marketing being a woman-owned business might be an asset. And I learned from the American Airlines website that they were looking to work with qualified WBEs. Uh, ironically, we did not get the American Airlines business. But after they learned about uh, Soundtrack Marketing's capabilities, they referred us to the US government, uh, for which we were awarded a contract to do all the music and entertainment for Air Force One. Uh, today, our government business has expanded. And I think it was um, our status as a diverse supplier that helped us get in the door. Um, I would say that um, you know I want to think about this sort of you know, this diverse status has a value. And I would recommend that diverse suppliers like us uh, research the internet, look at potential clients, uh, look at their websites, and see if they have a supplier diversity program. 
why you want to do this is because they often, this is a really good place to learn about a company, about their procurement process. It's a way to find contact information through their business. Um, as Nestle pointed out earlier, they have actually an educational space for you to go and learn about Nestle. And then um, also, and lastly, uh, as a diverse company, I found that attending these, you know, diversity trade shows for whatever organization you, you know, you're associated with, um, go to their trade shows, go to their conferences. Um, these things lead to training and mentoring opportunities that really go a long way in helping. Uh, well, obviously, they've helped us uh, create, um, you know, advantages for the company. Uh, I wouldn't be sitting here if I hadn't done some, you know, networking and showed up at some, you know, event. I wouldn't be participating in this webinar. So really, that's what you want to do. Um, of course, you know we do awesome work, and we provide the best customer service, and we deliver our products and our services at competitive price points. But the supplier diversity status and the optimal utilization of these programs can really help us increase and grow our businesses. And I think that's really what's the most interesting thing for me and for our company as a WBE. Uh, at that point, I think at this point, I will hand the mic back to uh, Karen Blackwell at Nestle. And um, you can take it from there with questions and comments, Karen. Yes. Uh, here is a slide that tells you how to enter your questions into the online portal so that I will have visibility. Uh, if you look to the right hand of your screen, you'll see a um, dashboard similar to what you see here. Uh, please enter your question in this portion and then use your uh, control panel and push the send button and then I will see your question. And I know that that's working because we have two questions already in the queue. I'm hoping that we'll have some more. Uh, and while I, we get a couple of those questions in the mix, let's go to uh, the first question that we have here, which is, this question is for you, David. How do your customers let you know they are looking for your support of their supplier diversity programs? There are two ways. We primarily are notified by a client uh, their interest in uh, some sort of supplier diversity program and whatever their parameters might be. The one way would be during contract negotiations or the RFP process where we are trying to win the business of an advertiser. Uh, supplier diversity is a component within all the major corporations that we deal with. So it's at that time we discuss what their program is, what they would like to see happen. Uh, they ask us what our program is and the components and the things that we're versed in. The other way it happens is through contact. The t most often the supplier diversity person from the advertiser will call me and say and explain that we have a supplier diversity program. Here are some goals or initiatives that we flow down to our key first tier suppliers, and we're looking for your support, McCann Erickson, in these initiatives. So it normally happens in one of those two ways, either in contract negotiation time, RFP process, and or direct phone contact uh, between the supplier diversity manager and myself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. And I know that you and I connected uh, with that latter type of uh, communication where we reached out uh, to find out about your supplier diversity program, and then we learned about your commitment. The next question is to you, Danette, which is, what repetitive issues or challenges have you observed when trying to sell to a first peer supplier? What repetitive issues have we run into? Um, I think uh, the, probably the biggest thing is the timing. The challenge of, you know, you meet somebody, they're not looking for your business now. Uh, and how do you keep in their mind so when it comes up that you are on their list? And nurturing those relationships. And which ones do you nurture? And, and really that it's the timing of how you invest in how you invest in that because, you know, 
that's a you know that's the weeding and the feeding it's the growing the garden kind of thing if you've got if you go to a, let's say a conference and there are 50 companies there and you go and work the room and you hit all 50 companies you will overwhelm yourself and you'll get buried but if you target ones that you really believe that there's a true relationship that should be grown there and you keep going with that relationship as david said you know your website's key so you know if you have news about something you've done an accomplishment that's been made you'll want to let them know and you'll want to put it on your website and you'll want to be in communication be sure you know give them a press release or something keep those keep those relationships going and and put that in your sort of schedule of work but don't you know don't try and go online after this webinar and find you know all the advertising agencies and I'm going to hit them all and then I'm going to you know do these these giant swipes it, I think you have to realize it's a you know there's there's a time factor for you and you want to nurture the ones that are really going to grow in your garden and where you really believe in the successful relationship thank you Jeanette um, looking at the uh, internet, we have a couple of great questions that have come in. This one is from Craig, and Craig wants to know, does Nestle have an approved vendor list, and if yes, how do we get on it? Well, Craig, that's really the reason that we have come to you with this format today. Nestle does not have an approved sub diverse supplier list as it relates to this space. We have a list that extremely small of key suppliers, suppliers like McCann, suppliers that are able to manage our business at a global level and have a global reach. And because the um, list of vendors on that list is so small and so stratified because of their ability to deliver against that objective, we have asked McCann and other key suppliers and I need to let you know that we have other key suppliers as well in the advertising and marketing space to support the supplier diversity initiative. So that's how we do it and um, I would recommend that you would do some research to be able to understand better the companies that uh, are part of our portfolio. I'll go to the next question here and um, someone is asking if we will go back at the end, I will do this at the end. This is Everett Bracken who is asking if we will go at the uh, end and close out this uh, presentation by focusing on the key contact information for each of the speakers. And I will do that at the end, Everett. The next one is from Sabrina. And Sabrina wants to know, where is the best place to go to find a list of key suppliers? And if those key suppliers are working off of an approved vendor list, how can you find this out? Well, David, I know the question is to me, but because you're the expert in your area of business, I need some help here. What I would recommend first, Sabrina, is that I know that there are publications like Advertising Age uh, that list from time to time the companies that are doing Nestle work, and I have seen diverse suppliers be very successful in following that thread to be able to um, meet and connect with the right companies. I can also tell you that last year we supported the Mosaic Vendor Fair that the AAF produces annually and we reached out to our uh, key suppliers in this space and asked them to participate at that conference. So that was another way to be able to meet directly with Nestle um, key suppliers who would be able to understand how diverse suppliers on the phone would be able to fit into the business case. David, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Um, another suggestion I would have would be uh, this is one of the times going to a large trade fair like WeBank's trade fair or the NMSGC trade fair comes in handy. Uh, because you have all these booths and you have uh, representatives in the booths. Frequently, we all know that the people who are in the booths are not the real decision makers, but what they are are resources to get names. So if you're at working a trade fair, that would be a good time to ask that representative, who, would, who are your key suppliers? Who Tell me I'm in this space. 
So tell me who are your key suppliers for this space. And if they don't know it then, get their business card and say, can I call you back in a day? I understand that you might not know that off the top of your head. Can I call you back in a day or two and get that information from you? So uh, that's one of the things that's a good thing to use that contact person that you meet at trade fairs to find out who are these uh, key suppliers that they're working with. Another way of doing it from the uh, advertising agency side would be to go to the websites of the advertising agencies, be it McCann Erickson or be it any of the other large general market agencies, and you will find very robust websites that give client lists. And they will tell you who the clients are for those agencies, so you can kind of back into it that way also to find out which agency is working with which clients. And you, you bring those two together, those names that you got from the one side and which agencies are connected to clients on the other side. Uh, so it's those kind of strategies that will help you eventually form a picture of who are the key suppliers for the different companies. Great, thank you. The next question, and there are a lot of Nestle questions here. The next question is from Barbara, who asks, does Nestle recommend publications to use for their advertising outreach? And um, I would like to say that we have, a, the media spend is directed through one of our key suppliers. We don't have a list of magazines. We use our key suppliers that are able to do the um, evaluation of the marketplace to find out where Nestle's going to get the greatest return for placing advertising. But I do know that we do support um, magazines such as Minority Business Enterprise, MBE, if you want to find out about what Nestle is doing in supplier diversity. If you want to know about things that are other than that, we would have to go to our key suppliers. But if you uh, send me an email, and I'll give you guys my email address at the end of this, I'll be happy to follow up and maybe do some more research um, on that question. The Karen, next, if I, oh, yes. Mm -hmm. If Please I can see. build on your answer a little bit, uh, because that's a very common question that is asked. The way these, it works, a media plan is written up between the brand managers of an advertising uh, on the client side in this case, let's say it's Nestle, but it could be anyone. And then you've got the advertising agency, such as a McCann Erickson. So those two teams will get together, and they're going to come up with a media plan. And the media plan is driven by research. There is a tremendous amount of research. Almost nothing happens in an advertising space that is not supported by significant research, focus groups, numbers, evaluations. And from all of that, and then you've got the individual targets that a uh, industry and advertiser might want to go at. So there's this, these huge media plans are derived, and it's out of those media plans and out of that committee and team that the determination is made as to where specific publications are going to go. Thank you. That that's the uh, that's the professional specific part that I was not aware of, and that's why I'm so glad you're part of this today, David, because you know so much about your, your industry. You are a professional. Uh, there's a next question. is a kind of a housekeeping question, and uh, someone has gone on to the supplier teleconference.nestleusa.com link, and they're thinking that it is uh, confidential. It isn't. We need anybody who wants to get that information to create a a login and password, and then you can easily search that site to better understand how we procure in the various categories. It takes about three minutes to register. The next question is, how will we be notified if there is an RFP rollout? Well, I, I think that that goes back to the whole issue of whether you are a key supplier or not. Key suppliers are in direct communication with our procurement team, as well as their contacts um, around the brands. And so that information is communicated that way. Uh, many times we use uh, e-sourcing tools and Ariba tool to actually conduct the, uh, the RFP or the RFQ. And that's how we manage that. That was from Nathan. Uh, and if I can oh, jump in yes, there again, from a 
second from a first tier perspective and now I'm speaking very much about limited to the advertising marketing industry uh, most agencies don't really have a it's very decentralized you do not have a mark a, a purchasing department so uh, when the question made reference to a rollout of an RFP or something like that it's not like public sector where there's this public in a newspaper RFP process uh, it really is decentralized at, at many, many agencies, and especially for those things that happen in, within broadcast, print uh, production, art production, those are very, very decentralized. So it's about relationships and it's about asking the right person at the right time for an opportunity to bid on something. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question uh, brings a smile to my lips and it says, how do you get past the door or message keepers? And I find that humorous because I guess I would be one of those door or message keepers. David, they might think the same with you. And the fact that we are on a webinar uh, taking direct comments so that we can have a candid conversation to me indicates that um, the door keeper, message keeper kind of uh, label might be a little bit passe, I think that the key to being able to interface with um, the supplier diversity people or the contacts of different organizations is to be really clear and understand how that company manages their program. And I would say that the more robust the website around supplier diversity and that company, then the more access you will find. David, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, that's a very common and a very good question. Uh, and my response to that when I hear that type of question is to recognize the role of the supplier diversity person. In some respects, it is partially a gatekeeper position because some companies want to funnel and keep track of all of the diverse suppliers that contact them, not as a way necessarily of being a barrier, but as a means that that supplier diversity person is also the advocate for that business to get them in front of the right decision maker and to help knock down barriers within that organization. So you have to understand first and foremost what is the role and then you can control your expectations of that person. But the actual best way to meet decision makers, or not the best way, another good way of doing it would be networking events attend WeBank events, NMSDC events, your local council event. Frequently, if there's a dinner, the supplier diversity manager brings decision makers along with them to that dinner. So during the cocktail hour or during the dinner, if it's a table of 10 and you are at that table, that's a great time where you might meet a head of production or a head of uh, some functional department because they do attend those types of events. Great. I think that's can great. I, and that can gives I throw a, in a, a Sure, Sure, can I throw in yes, a perspective on this? Um, I think, you know, part of the, the sort of last two questions that I felt like is, you know, the get your head in the game, you know, idea is like we're trying, you know, I'm hearing people like going, okay, what's my strategy of of doing this? But, you know, if you think about it, you're you're coming at this with a service and th they need you. And you need to sort of be needed. And, and when you're talking to somebody, you also want to make their job easier. If you go, as David said earlier, and say, you know, well, how do I find about, out about an RFP in your industry? If you say, you know, I have been reading Adweek for, a, you know, a year. And, you know, every once in a while I'll see an RFP pop up. But, you know, there must be a place that they put that. This, this is like, you know, now I see that you've done some research kind of thing, and he might say, oh, they don't put it in Adweek, they put it in this magazine, or, you know, you're looking in the wrong place. But at least he's talking to somebody who's thinking and doing, and the open-ended question of how do I, it, it's, it's like, I don't know, you know, if you're a busy mother and you've got four kids going, help me, help me, help me, help me, you can't do, do all of them, but if they're each one doing a little bit, moving it forward, you're going to help the one that's the easiest first. So make it easy for the person that you want help from 
by doing your homework and showing up with some helpful information about where you want to go with this. Um, you should know, you know, before when you're going to a supplier diversity, at least who, what kind of company are you going to be talking to? Like David said, you know, you don't want to be going with your furniture company and going, I want to talk to your ad agency because maybe they're building a building. That's such a, you know, a long dart, you know, shot in the dark. So how helpful can you be out of the gate? Because if I see you, you know, if you're helpful out of the gate, then it makes it easier for them to grease the wheels for you. Thank you. I think that also, you know, the perspective of the diverse supplier we think is critical. And so, Danette, thanks for also, you know, speaking out from your experiences. David, the next question is for you. And it says, aside from how you handle clients' diverse supplier referrals, what does McCann do to grow and develop its own base of uh, diverse suppliers? Primarily, it's through active participation in groups, again, such as NMSDC and local councils on um, WeBank uh, involvement in networking events that are specific to the advertising, marketing, communication industry groups. So our real focus at McCann Erickson uh, is now development to, to identify uh, those vendors who have achieved a, a degree of, of success and world-class quality and, and looking to help them get to the next level in those areas where we have a need. Um, so we pretty much for the last three years have developed a very comprehensive uh, directory of diverse suppliers. So we know on a national basis who's out there. Um, so really it's now about uh, doing what we can to work along with other large general market agencies. This is one place where our competitors and McCann, we work together to create opportunities. So um, that, that's really how we do it. We know who's out there. It's really just trying to find now opportunities for people to uh, demonstrate that they can do the work at a world-class level and uh, get people in a position to be successful when the opportunities do arise. Okay, great. And you know, there's a follow-up question, and this is from Brian. That I think follows this question well, or your statement well. And he asks that while we've talked about websites, how much other social media uh, outlets do we review when trying to investigate a diverse suppliers' capabilities? Do do we use Facebook blog? So let's pose that to both. David first, and do you review it? And then Danette second, and do you use it? Um, I, Danette, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, please. The, yes, the answer is a definite yes. The advertising industry is a young person's business. So the people, the typical employees within an advertising agency, uh, within the functional departments, and they who are decision makers, or and make the recommendations on so many things are of the generation of using social media. So everything that you can think of, that's what our people do on a daily basis. And they'll go anywhere to look at something. The thing they, that is hard to get them to look at is a printed piece of paper that comes in the mail. But well, we're I fine with any electronic format. That is where our people are, are used to looking for information and that's where they want and expect the information to be. Okay, I, I think that's that's great. We know that you guys look at it and expect that. How about Danette from a diverse suppliers um, perspective? Are you using social media to help promote your business to let companies know about your capabilities? Well, it's funny. Before we started the webinar, uh, Phil Sewell over at AAF and I were discussing social media and and how important it is. Um, and, uh, you know, just that, that I like to call it the wild, wild west in the certain sense that, you know, take what, what works for you and use it. And if you, if you can rock the Twitter, then do it. If you are mediocre on the Twitter, don't, don't be lame, you know. Don't do something that's not your strength because that will not create the energy and the good and the, you know, the awesome ideas that you have. If you can't convey it in a certain media, find the ones that work for you and 
and work them. You know, use use all of these tools. You've got tons and tons of ways to communicate through, you know, without without killing trees here. And um, the best advice I would say is it's you know it's kind of open now and do what you do best. You know, if you have um, you know, if you really can manage a really excellent Facebook and that's all you got, then make it the best it can be. Um, you know, I think that's really, you know, the important thing because it's always changing and it's always switching and that's sort of the fun of it um, is that it's, you know, it's never dull. It's always, there's always new ideas coming out. So I would say, you know, find what works for you and, you know, make it, Make it work. Make that happen. You know, uh, we started a few minutes late. Um, we're prepared to go another 10 minutes, which would bring it to the full hour. Uh, anyone who cannot stay, please remember that you will be able to find this presentation on the AAF website. And we will uh, end it with a, a slide showing our communication uh, information. But um, I'll take a few more questions because we have a few people still on the line. Actually, most people are still on the line. I think that's exciting. So uh, this is from Michelle. And Michelle asks, once an agency is registered um, with a company supplier diversity program and then meets with the purchasing or procurement department to present capabilities, what is the best way to stay in touch? And I get that question a lot. People want to talk to me, but they don't want to be irritating. I'll go first. and. David, would you like to try the second and then um, sure. just a comment? Okay, sure. I, I would like to say that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to send emails to let me know new and exciting things that you're doing. Um, if I have had a conversation with you and there is nothing at that point in time, um, um, another um, a question at the end of that conversation where you say, well, Karen, can I call you back again in, let's say, uh, six months? Or you could ask, when do you think would be a great time for me to call back? Usually I'll say, well, how about in, um, let's say, four months from now? Or I'll say, well, you know, that uh, that's an interesting area. The, uh, we're going to be having a the marketing meeting is going to be in about held in June of the year. So you might want to circle back to me in September. I find that follow-up calls are always strengthening. It's a way to build a relationship. But I also need to say that a call every week or a call every month, that um, usually is counterproductive. David, what would you say? Uh, I would agree with what you said. And I'd also go back to something Danette mentioned, uh, where you have some significant accomplishment, uh, some new good sized piece of business or any good news, uh, shooting an email to the supplier diversity person and the functional decision maker who hopefully you have met uh, is always a good thing and that can be done monthly and won't be viewed as being a pest or anything. Uh, so that that's a email used that way to convey good news, not just to send three paragraphs of just basic text. But sharing good news, uh, share and drop names in these emails. That you recently won some work at Coca-Cola. That you did something recently for Microsoft. Uh, those types of things, people do notice that. But it's that long, boring text that that is would be you know counterproductive, and you would not want to do. But it, yeah, you need to keep your 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 company name and your name in front of uh, functional decision makers. Um, but make it through a positive way. I agree. Danette, would you like to add how, what you might find as something that you employ as a way to stay on uh, companies' minds? Yeah, I mean, I think that the with just the functionality of email, when you open it, your logo, uh, your contact information should be on that, should fit on that first screen. So if you're saying that you just got a contract to do, you know, some creative work for, you know, McCann Erickson, um, the headline needs to be there. And all the details, you know, to read, that can be in it, but I think you want your contact information, who's the point person on the project, and, you know, what's the, what's the story in a sentence or less, because, uh, you know, this is, 
this is what people take with them, and this is what people will respond to initially. And if I have to find the contact information and it takes me a while, I mean, just a case that happened yesterday is a, there's a new Aretha Franklin record came out, and it, I couldn't figure out what record label was putting it out, and I read yeah. the whole thing twice. So it's so, really good to make you know, that, that information. That should be that hard, you know. Make front. it easy on yourself. Right, right. I, I'd like to also just throw something out that um, I've seen work in reaching out to me, and that is at uh, supplier diversity fairs when we're at a trade show. It's remarkable how I will remember somebody who says, "Oh my gosh, would you like some water? I see that you've been talking to forty people," or I remember there was a woman who uh, just stuck around and helped us put down our booth at the end of the day. You have to remember that everybody, we're all still people, and sometimes when uh, we do have the ability to connect, it's the smallest personal touch that really will help move you to the, to the top of the list and help keep you uh, on someone's mind. Or it could be that that small connection that you made, when uh, you call, it'll, they'll remember, oh, that's right. You're the, you're the person that brought me the glass of water when I was uh, giving a speech or, you know, helped us take our uh, portfolio down. You never know how the smallest thing can, can help. Um, let me ask, we'll go to the web to look at another question. And it, I guess we have time for two or three more questions. And it says, uh, how do you drive second tier spend with your advertising partners? And this is from Aaron so that diverse suppliers are actually given consideration. The advertising industry is a very tight-knit in terms of vendor alliances, and new suppliers attempting to gain a foothold have a very difficult time. David, would you like to take a look at this? Sure, sure. Um, a very good question, a very uh, a frequently asked question. And uh, regrettably, uh, I think the person asking the question already knows the answer. It's tough to be a new guy. Uh, that's not being flip or being callous. That's the honest answer. It's tough to be new because the advertising industry, as the person stated, uh, does tend to stay with the same vendors, be the diverse vendors and majority vendors. They do st do it. Now, why do they do it? They seem to do it more so than you'll see in other industries because from the time that a advertising agency gets the approval from the client to go ahead and produce this TV commercial or produce this, this magazine spread or whatever the case might be, can be less than 30 days turnaround time. So what happens is it's pure human nature. If you've got 30 days to turn around something of world-class quality, are you really going to go to anyone new? The answer, I'm sure most would agree, is no. That's not the time to make that happen. So the new person in their sales strategy to that first tier supplier has to always be looking for an opportunity. You're not looking to work on that shoot that's for this major car commercial. You're looking for some opportunity to get your foot in the door so you can build that credibility, build that relationship so that when a significant job does come along, people are comfortable with going, you're no longer considered a new vendor. But it, it's tough. It's persistency and just working those relationships. And again, I used the word task earlier. Find some task, some smaller task that you can do so you can get your foot in the door and demonstrate your quality, your service, so that the people will then feel comfortable with, and they're working within a tight time frame to give you a shot. Thank you. Uh, I think that that's a, a very direct answer. Um, let's take our last question, which is that uh, this is a question from Kara, and she says, I'm wondering if there are any areas of services like digital communications that an agency like McCann might need more than others and that you would consider outsourcing? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it's no secret. Uh, digital right now is the hot area. So anything that is uh, gaming, app development, uh, 
uh, anything that is cutting edge using the internet mobile media, interactive media, anything like that, not just McCann, but all advertisers and all advertising agencies are interested for that. That's the gold ticket right now. Okay. I think that that's a, that's a good one. Um, I guess at this time, I'm looking at our uh, time right here, and it looks like we really are at the end. Uh, this has been very, very informative. I am finding that it's difficult for us to, for me to have this thing go backwards, to be able to tell you what our uh, contact information is. Let's see. Here it is. I think we end. We will end with this slide up so that you're able to see our contact information. I'd like to thank both David and Danette for providing what I found to be very valuable insights. I'm Karen Blackall with Nestle. I really want to thank the AAF for making this format available and uh, congratulate them on making sure that the Mosaic Center continues to do this good work. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, David. And thank you, Danette. Um, thank you to everybody that joined us today. We had a pretty good turnout. I just want to remind everybody that if you go to www.aaf.org forward slash webinars uh, with the S at the end, don't forget that, aaf.org forward slash webinars, uh, you can find this one. We should have it up on the site um, by close of business today. Um, and you'll be able to uh, view the PowerPoint presentation as well as watch a recorded version of this webinar. Um, as well as some of the past uh, webinars we, we've held, we have some uh, candid conversations webinars that have taken place prior to this one, and we have some, I believe, scheduled in the near future. And keep checking back because there will be more after that. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close this out. I just want to thank everybody again and hope to see everybody again soon.